The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy by Douglas Adams The podcast versions of the original Facebook Live readings during the coronavirus outbreak by Matthew Ogden, The Bearded Wit. Please bear in mind that as Facebook Live recordings, these are rough and ready, there are mistakes, there are a few trip-ups here and there, and there is laughter from the reader as he goes through and follows the humour himself along with you, the listener. We hope you enjoy listening to these and share liberally. Part 27 Before we begin, I'd like to ask you to seriously consider becoming a patron of The Bearded Wit by going to patreon.com forward slash The Bearded Wit. You can support me from as little as $5 a month, which is essentially a cup of coffee, uh, and that will mean that I will be able to continue producing this material and other podcasts that I do, and it would mean the world to me to have you um, know that you're, you've got my back on this. Uh, I love producing this material for people, and it's been a huge pleasure for me to do this, uh, which basically starts as a project for family and friends right back at the beginning of March last year uh, when the um, uh, COVID-19 virus was really beginning to kick in. It was a way of basically connecting friends and family all over the world who were finding it a bit difficult as we all did and it's grown into something where I've got a lot of people listening all over the world. It would mean the world to me if you could take the time just to pop over to uh, patreon.com forward slash the bearded wit sign up from as little as five dollars a month as i say uh it's a cup of coffee it would mean the world to me because the more of you guys you fabulous people out there that do it the more i'm able to do more of this stuff for you on an ongoing basis no obligation but if you can i would be so deeply grateful also if you could take a moment to pop over to facebook and uh, give the bearded wit a like and follow uh, and also go over to my new youtube channel as well um, just search for the bearded wit uh, and subscribe uh, i'll be putting all of the live readings slightly edited um, and cleaned up a bit uh, onto that uh, over the coming weeks um, but yeah join up uh, get involved like share follow subscribe do all the usual social media things Okay, on with the reading. Thanks very much, everyone. Right, Um, in terms of where we got to with Mostly Harmless, um, we have had a bit of um, an introduction to an alternative timeline, as it were, with a Tricia Macmillan, um, who has met up with Grebulons, and Grebulons are on a mission who basically... um, don't know what the hell they're doing because as part of their mission a meteorite smashed out the memory banks of their ship in which all of their memories everybody on the ship was stored they'd been downloaded so um, they are uh, currently inhabiting the uh, newly discovered planet Rupert Rupert, um, which is way out on the the, uh, very far edges of the solar system Uh, and they've um, come to Earth and they have picked up Trisha McMillan, who is another timeline's version of Trillion. Uh, And we've also found out via Ford Prefect's adventures in trying to deliver his uh, um, expenses account to the offices of the guide that things are not as perhaps they might ordinarily seem to be. Things are a bit weird in this reality. Uh, And we've lost touch completely with anything to do with Arthur Dent or, or Fenchurch or anyone else, um, apart from those. Um, so, let us find out if we see anything more in this book about Arthur Dent. Chapter 7 Arthur... Oh, hey, he's here. Arthur Dent... I knew that. Arthur Dent had been in some hell holes in his life, but he had never before seen a spaceport which had a sign saying, even travelling despondently is better than arriving here. To welcome visitors, the arrival hall featured a picture of the president of Now What, smiling. It was the only picture of anybody could find of him, and it had been taken shortly after he had shot himself. So although the photo had been retouched as well as could be managed, the smile it wore was rather a ghastly one. 
The side of his head had been drawn back in, in crayon. No replacement had been found for the photograph because no replacement had been found for the president. There was only one ambition which anyone on the planet ever had, and that was to leave. Arthur checked himself into a small motel on the outskirts of town and sat glumly on the bed, which was damp, and flipped through the little information brochure, brochure which was also damp. It said that the planet of Nawat had been named after the opening words of the first settlers to arrive there after struggling across light years of space to reach the furthest unexplored outreaches of the galaxy. The main town was called, oh well, there weren't any other towns to speak of. Settlement on Now What had not been a success, and the sort of people who actually wanted to live on Now What were not the sort of people you would want to spend any time with. Trading was mentioned in the brochure. The main trade that was carried out was in the skins of the Nawatian bog hog, but it wasn't a very successful one because no one in their right minds would want to buy a Nawatian bog hog skin. The trade only hung on by its fingernails because there was always a significant number of people in the galaxy who were not in their right minds. Arthur had felt very uncomfortable looking around at some of the other occupants of the small passenger compartment of the ship. The brochure described some of the history of the planet. Whoever had written it had obviously started out trying to drum up a little enthusiasm for the place by stressing that it wasn't actually cold and wet all the time, but could find little positive to add to this, so the tone of the piece quickly degenerated into savage irony. It talked about the early years of settlement. It said that the major activities pursued on Nawat were those of catching, skinning and eating Nawati and hog, bog hogs, which were the only extant form of animal life on Nawat, and others having long ago died, all others having long ago died of despair. The bog hogs were tiny, vicious creatures, and the small margin by which they fell short of being completely inedible was the margin by which life on the planet subsisted. So what were the rewards, however small, that made life on now what worth living? Well, there weren't any. Not a one. Even making yourself some protective clothing out of bog hog skins was an exercise in disappointment and futility, since the skins were unaccountably thin and leaky. This caused a lot of puzzled conjecture amongst the settlers. What was the bog hog secret of keeping warm? If anyone had ever learnt the language the bog hog spoke to each other each day, they would have discovered that there was no trick. The bog hogs were as cold and wet as anyone else on the planet. No one had the slightest desire to learn the language of the bog hogs for the simple reason that these creatures communicated by biting each other very hard on the thigh. Life on Nawat, being what it was, most of what a bog hog might have to say about it could easily be signified by these means. Arthur flipped through the brochure till he found what he was looking for. At the back there were a few maps of the planet. They were fairly rough and ready, because they weren't likely to be of much interest to anyone, but they told him what he wanted to know. He didn't recognise it at first, because the maps were the other way up from the way he would have expected, and looked, therefore, thoroughly unfamiliar. Of course, up and down, north and south, are absolutely arbitrary designations, but we are used to seeing things the way we are used to seeing them, and Arthur had to turn the maps upside down to make any sense of them. There was one huge landmass off on the upper left-hand side of the page, which tapered down to a tiny waist and then ballooned out again like a large comma. On the right-hand side was a collection of large shapes, jumbled familiarly together. The outlines were not exactly the same, and Arthur didn't know if this was just because the map was so rough or because the sea level was higher, or because, well, things were just different here. But the evidence was inarguable. This was definitely the Earth. Or rather, it most definitely was not. 
It merely looked a lot like the Earth and occupied the same coordinates in space-time. What coordinates it occupied in probability was anybody's guess. He sighed. This, he realised, was about as close to home as he was ever likely to get, which meant that he was about as far from home as he possibly could be. Glumly, he slapped the brochure shut and wondered what on earth he was going to do next. He allowed himself a hollow laugh at what he had just thought. He looked at his old watch and shook it a bit to wind it. It had taken him, according to his own time scale, a year of hard travelling to get here. A year since the accident in hyperspace in which Fenchurch had completely vanished. One minute she'd been sitting there next to him in the slump jet, the next minute the ship had done a perfectly normal hyperspace hop, and when he had next looked she was not there. The seat wasn't even warm. Her name wasn't even on the passenger list. The space line had been very wary of him when he'd complained. A lot of awkward things happen in space travel, and a lot of them make a lot of money for lawyers. But when they'd asked him what galactic sector he and Fenchurch had been from, and he had said ZZ9 plural Z Alpha, they had relaxed completely in a way that Arthur wasn't at all sure he liked. They even laughed a little, though sympathetically, of course. They pointed to the clause in the ticket contract, which said that entities whose lifespans had originated in any of the plural zones were advised not to travel in hyperspace, and did so entirely at their own risk. Everybody, they said, knew that. They tittered slightly and shook their heads. As Arthur had left their offices, he found he was trembling slightly. Not only had he lost Fenchurch in the most complete and utter way possible, but he felt that the more time he spent away out in the galaxy, the more it seemed that the number of things he didn't know about anything actually increased. Just as he was lost for a moment in these numb memories, a knock came on the door of his motel room, which then opened immediately. A fat and dishevelled man came in carrying Arthur's one small case. He got as far as, where shall I put it, when there was a sudden violent flurry and he collapsed heavily against the door, trying to beat off a small and mangy creature that had leapt snarling out of the wet night and buried its teeth in his thigh, even through the thick layers of leather padding he wore there. There was a brief ugly confusion of jabbering and thrashing. The man shouted frantically and pointed. Arthur grabbed a hefty stick that stood next to the door expressly for this purpose and beat at the bog hog with it. The bog hog suddenly disengaged and limped backwards, dazed and forlorn. It turned anxiously in the corner of the room, its tail tucked up right under its back legs, and stood looking nervously up at Arthur, jerking its head awkwardly and repeatedly to one side. Its jaw appeared to be dislocated. It cried a little and scraped its damp tail across the floor. By the door, the fat man with Arthur's suitcase was sitting and cursing, trying to staunch the flow of blood from his thigh. His clothes were already wet from the rain. Arthur stared at the bog hog, not knowing what to do. The bog hog looked at him questioningly. It tried to approach him, making mournful little whimpering noises. It moved its jaw painfully. It made a sudden leap for Arthur's thigh, but its dislocated jaw was too weak to get a grip, and it sank, whining sadly, down to the floor. The man jumped to his feet, grabbed the stick, beat the bog hog's brains into a sticky, pulpy mess on the thin carpet, and then stood there breathing heavily as if daring the animal to move again, just once. A single bog hog eyeball sat looking reproachfully at Arthur from out of the mashed ruins of its head. 
"'What do you think it was trying to say?' asked Arthur in a small voice. "'Ah, nothing much,' said the man. "'Just its way of trying to be friendly. "'This is just our way of being friendly back,' he added, hefting the stick. "'When's the next flight out?' asked Arthur. "'I thought you'd only just arrived,' said the man. "'Yes,' said Arthur. "'It was only going to be a brief visit. "'I just wanted to see if this was the right place or not. "'Sorry.' "'You mean you're on the wrong planet?' said the man lugubriously. "'Funny how many people say that, especially the people who live here.' He eyed the remains of the bog-hog with a deep ancestral resentment. "'Oh, no,' said Arthur. "'It's the right planet, all right.' He picked up the damp brochure lying on the bed and put it in his pocket. "'It's OK, thanks. I'll take that,' he said, taking the case from the man. He went to the door and looked out into the cold, wet night. "'Yeah, it's the right planet, all right,' he said again. "'Right planet? Wrong universe.' A single bird wheeled in the sky above him as he set off back for the spaceport. Ford had his own code of ethics. It wasn't much of one, but it was his, and he stuck by it, more or less. One rule he had made was never to buy his own drinks. He wasn't sure if that counted as an ethic, but you have to go with what you've got. He was also firmly and utterly opposed to all and any forms of cruelty to any animals whatsoever, except geese. And furthermore, he would never steal from his employers. Well, not exactly steal. If his account supervisor didn't start to hyperventilate and put out a seal-all-exit security alert when Ford handed in his expenses claim, then Ford felt he wasn't doing his job properly. But actually, stealing was another thing. That was biting the hand that feeds you. Sucking very hard on it, even nibbling it in an affectionate kind of way, was OK. But you didn't actually bite it. Not when that hand was the guide. The guide was something sacred and special. But that, thought Ford, as he ducked and weaved his way down through the building, was about to change. And they had only themselves to blame. Look at all this stuff. Lines of neat grey office cubicles and executive workstation pods. The whole place was dreary, with the hum of memos and minutes of meetings flitting through its electronic networks. Out in the street, they were playing Hunt the Wocket for Zark's sake, but here, in the very heart of the guide offices, no one was even recklessly kicking a ball around the corridors or wearing inappropriately coloured beachwear. Infinidim Enterprises Fort snarled to himself as he stalked rapidly down one corridor after another. Door after door magically opened to him without question. Elevators happily took him to places they should not. Ford was trying to pursue the most tangled and complicated route he could, heading generally downwards through the building. His happy little robot took care of everything, spreading waves of acquiescent joy through all the security circuits it encountered. Ford thought it needed a name, and decided to call it Emily Saunders, after a girl he had very fond memories of. Then he thought Emily Saunders was an absurd name for a security robot, and decided to call it Colin instead, after Emily's dog. He was moving deep into the bowels of the building now, into areas he had never entered before, areas of higher and higher security. He was beginning to encounter puzzled looks from the operatives he passed. At this level of security, you didn't even call them people any more, and they were probably doing stuff that only operatives would do. When they went home to their families in the evening, they became people again, and when their little children looked up to them with their sweet, shining eyes and said, Daddy, what did you do all day today? 
They just said, I performed my duties as an operative, and left it at that. The truth of the matter was that all sorts of highly dodgy stuff went on behind the cheery, happy-go-lucky front that the guide liked to put up, or used to like to put up before this new Infinidim Enterprises bunch marched in and started to make the whole thing highly dodgy. There were all kinds of tax scams and rackets and graft and shady deals supporting the shining edifice, and down in the secure research and data processing levels of the building was where it all went on. Every few years, the guide would set up its business, and indeed its building, on an entirely new world, and all would be sunshine and laughter for a while as the guide would put down its roots in the local culture and economy, provide employment, a sense of glamour and adventure, and in the end not quite as much actual revenue as the locals had expected. It's a bit like Amazon, really. When the guide moved on, taking its building with it, it left a little it left a little like a thief in the night. Well, exactly like a thief in the night, in fact. It usually left in the very early hours of the morning, and the following day there always turned out to be a very great deal of stuff missing. Whole cultures and economies would collapse in its wake, often within a week, leaving once thriving planets des it's definitely like Amazon sorry. <laughs> this is gonna get me kicked off their podcast, sorry. Whole cultures and economies would collapse in its wake, often within a week, leaving once thriving planets desolate and shell shocked, but still somehow feeling that they'd been part of some great adventure. The operatives who shot puzzled glances at Ford as he marched on into the depths of the building's most sensitive areas were reassured by the presence of Colin, who was flying along with him in a buzz of emotional fulfilment and easing his path for him at every stage. Alarms were starting to go off in other parts of the building. Perhaps that meant that Van Hal had already been discovered, which might be a problem. Ford had been hoping he would be able to slip the identities back into his pocket before he came round. But well, that was a problem for later, and he didn't, for the moment, have the faintest idea how he was going to solve it. For the moment, he wasn't going to worry. Wherever he went with little Colin, he was surrounded by a cocoon of sweetness and light and, most importantly, willing and acquiescent elevators and positively obsequious doors. Ford even began to whistle, which was probably his mistake. Nobody likes a whistler, particularly not the divinity that shapes our ends. The next door wouldn't open. And that was a pity, because it was the very one that Ford had been making for. It stood before him, grey, and resolutely closed, with a sign on it saying, No admittance, not even to authorised personnel. You are wasting your time here. Go away. Colin reported that the doors had been getting generally a lot grimmer down in these lower reaches of the building. They were about ten storeys below ground level now. The air was refrigerated, and the taste tasteful grey hessian wall weave had given away to brutal grey bolted steel walls. Colin's rampant euphoria had subsided into a kind of determined cheeriness. He said that he was beginning to tire a little. It was all taking his it was taking all his energy to pump the slightest bonhomie whatsoever into the doors down here. Ford kicked at the door. It opened. Mixture of pleasure and pain, he muttered. Always does the trick. He walked in, and Colin flew in after him. Even with a wire stuck straight into his pleasure electrode, his happiness was a nervous kind of happiness. He bobbed around a little. The room was small, grey, and humming. This was the nerve centre of the entire guide. The computer terminals that lined the grey walls were windows onto every aspect of the guide's operations. Here, on the left-hand side of the room, reports were gathered over the sub-Ethernet from field researchers in every corner of the galaxy, fed straight up into the network of sub-editors' offices, where they had all the good bits cut out by the secretaries because the sub-editors were out having lunch. 
The remaining copy would then be shot across to the other half of the building, the other leg of the H, which was the legal department. The legal department would cut out anything that was still even remotely good from what remained and fire it back to the offices of the executive editors, who were also out at lunch. So the editor's secretaries would read it and say it was stupid and cut most out of what was left. When any of the editors finally staggered in from lunch, they would exclaim, What is this feeble crap that X, where X was the name of the field researcher in question, has sent us from halfway across the bloody galaxy? What is the point of having somebody spending three whole orbital periods out in the bloody gangcracker mind zones with all that stuff going on out there if this load of anemic squitter is the best that he can be bothered to send us? Disallow his expenses! What should we do with the copy? the secretary would ask. Oh, put it out over the network. Got to have something going out there. I've got a headache. I'm going home. So the edited copy would go for one last slash and burn through the legal department and then be sent back down here where it would be broadcast out over the sub-ethernet for instantaneous retrieval anywhere in the galaxy. That was handled by equipment which was monitored and controlled by the terminals on the right-hand side of the room. Meanwhile, the order to disallow the researcher's expenses was relayed down to the computer terminal struck, stuck off on the right-hand corner, and it was to this terminal that Ford Prefect now swiftly made his way. If you are reading or listening to this on planet Earth, then A. Good luck to you. This is an awful lot of stuff you don't know anything about, but you are not alone in this. It's just that, in your case, the consequences of not knowing any of this stuff are particularly terrible. Um, but then, <laughs> hey, that's just the way the cookie gets completely stomped on and obliterated. B. Don't imagine you know what a computer terminal is. A computer terminal is not some clunky old television with a typewriter in front of it. It is an interface where the mind and body can connect with the universe and move bits of it around. Ford hurried over to the terminal, sat in front of it and quickly dipped himself into its universe. It wasn't the normal universe he knew, it was a universe of densely enfolded worlds, of wild topographies, towering mountain peaks, heart-stopping ravines, of moons shattering off into seahorses, hurtful blurting crevices, silently heaving oceans, and bottomless hurtling hooping funts. He held still to get his bearings. He controlled his breathing, closed his eyes, and looked again. So, this is where accountants spend their time. There was, clearly, much more to them than met the eye. He looked around carefully, trying not to let it all swell and swim and overwhelm him. He didn't know his way around this universe. He didn't even know the physical laws that determined its dimensional extents or behaviours. But his instinct told him to look for the most outstanding feature he could detect and make towards it. Way off in some indistinguishable distance was, was it a mile or a million or a moat in his eye, was a stunning peak that overarched the sky climbed and climbed and spread out in flowering aigrettes, agglomerates and archimandrites. He weltered towards it, hooling and thirling, and at last it reached in a meaninglessly long umpthinth of time. He clung to it, arms outspread, gripping tightly onto its roughly gnarled and pitted surface. Once he was certain that he was secure, he made the hideous mistake of looking down. While he had been weltering, hooling, and thurling, the distance between him uh, and had, uh, excuse me, while he had been weltering, hooling, and thurling, the distance beneath him had not bothered him unduly. But now that he was gripping, the distance made his heart wilt and his brain bend. His fingers were white with pain and tension. His teeth were grinding and twisting against each other beyond his control. His eyes turned inwards with waves from the willowing extremities of nausea. With an immense effort of will and faith, he simply let go 
and pushed. He felt himself float, float away, and then, counterintuitively, upwards and upwards. He threw his shoulders back, let his arms drop, gazed upwards, and let himself be drawn loosely, higher and higher. Before long, in so far as much as terms such as that had any meaning in this virtual universe, a ledge loomed up ahead of him, on which he could grip, and onto which he could clamber. He rose, he gripped, he clambered. He panted a little. This was all a little stressful. He held tightly onto the ledge as he sat. He wasn't certain if this was to prevent himself from falling down, oh, falling down off it, or rising up from it, but he needed something to grip on as he surveyed the world in which he found himself. The whirling, turning height spun him, and twisted his brain in upon itself until he found himself, eyes closed, whimpering and hugging the hideous wall of towering rock. He slowly brought his breathing back under control again. He told himself repeatedly that he was just in a graphic representation of a world, a virtual universe, a simulated reality. He could snap back out of it at any moment. He snapped back out of it. He was sitting in a blue leatherette foam-filled swivel-seated uh, office chair in front of a computer terminal. He relaxed. He was clinging onto the face of an impossibly high peak perched on a narrow ledge above a drop of brain-swivelling dimensions. It wasn't just the landscape being so far beneath him. He wished it would stop undulating and waving. He had to get a grip. Not on the rock wall. That was an illusion. He had to get a grip on the situation, be able to look at the physical world he was in while drawing himself out of it emotionally. He clenched inwardly, and then, just as he had let go of the rock face itself, he let go of the idea of the rock face, and let himself just sit there, clearly and freely. He looked out at the world. He was breathing well. He was cool. He was in charge again. He was in a four-dimensional topological model of the guide's financial systems. And somebody, or something, would, very shortly, want to know why. And here they came. Swooping through virtual space towards him came a small flock of mean and steely-eyed creatures with pointy little heads, pencil moustaches and querulous demands as to who he was and what he was doing there. <coughs> Pardon me what his authorization was, what the authorization of his authorizing agent was, and what his inside leg measurement was, and so on. Laser light flickered all over him, as if he was a packet of biscuits at a supermarket checkout. The heavier-duty laser guns were held for the moment in reserve. The fact that all of this was happening in virtual space made no difference. Being virtually killed by a virtual laser in virtual space is just as effective as the real thing, because you are as dead as you think you are. The laser readers were becoming very agitated as they flickered over his fingerprints, his retina, and the follicle pattern where his hairline was receding. They didn't like what they were finding at all. The chattering and screeching of highly personal and insolent questions was rising in pitch. A little surgical steel scraper was reaching out towards the skin at the nape of his neck when Ford, holding his breath and praying very slightly, pulled Van Hal's identity ease out of his pocket and waved it in front of them. Instantly, every laser was diverted to the little card and swept backwards and forwards over it and in it, examining and reading every molecule. Then, just as suddenly, they stopped. The entire flock of little virtual inspectors snapped to attention. "'Nice to see you, Mr. Harl,' they said in smarmy unison. "'Is there anything we can do for you?' Ford smiled, a slow and vicious smile. "'Do you know?' 
he said. I rather think there is. Five minutes later, he was out of there. About thirty seconds to do the job, three minutes thirty to cover his tracks. He could have done anything he liked in the virtual structure, more or less. He could have transferred ownership of the entire organisation into his own name, but he doubted if that would have gone unnoticed. He didn't want it anyway. It would have meant responsibility, working late nights at the office, not to mention massive and time-consuming fraud investigations, and a fair amount of time in jail. He wanted something that nobody other than the computer would notice. That was the bit that took 30 seconds. The thing that took 3 minutes and 30 was programming the computer not to notice that it had noticed anything. It had to want to not know what Ford was, about, was up to. And then he could safely leave the computer to rationalise its own defences against the information ever emerging. It was a programming technique that had been reverse-engineered from the sort of psychotic mental blocks that otherwise perfectly normal people had been observed invariably to develop when elected to high political office. If only that was as funny as it should be. The other minute was spent discovering that the computer system already had a mental block. A big one. He would never have discovered it if he hadn't been busy engineering a mental block himself. He came across a whole slew of smooth and plausible denial procedures and diversionary subroutines, exactly where he had been planning to install his own. The computer denied all knowledge of them, of course, then blankly refused to accept there was anything even to deny knowledge of, and was generally so convincing that even Ford almost found himself thinking he'd made a mistake. He was impressed. He was so impressed, in fact, that he didn't bother to install his own mental block procedures. He just set up calls to the ones that were already there, which then called themselves when questioned, and so on. He quickly set about debugging the little bits of code he ins had installed himself, only to discover that they weren't there. Cursing, he searched all over for them, but could find no trace of them at all. <coughs> he was just about to start installing them all over again, when he realised that the reason he couldn't find them was that they were working already. He grinned with satisfaction. He tried to discover that the compu uh, what the computer's other mental block was all about, but it seemed not unnaturally to have a mental block about it. He could no longer find any trace of it at all, in fact. It was that good. He wondered if he'd been imagining it. He wondered if he had been imagining that it was something to do with something in the building, and that something to do with the number 13. He ran a few tests. Yeah, obviously, he had been imagining it. Tea, I've got a frog in my throat. Sorry, folks. <clears throat> no time for fancy routes now. There was obviously a major security alert in process. Ford took the elevator up to the ground floor to change to the express elevators. He had somehow to get the identities back into Harl's pocket before it was missed. How? He didn't know. The doors of the elevator slid open to reveal a large posse of security guards and robots poised waiting for it, and brandishing filthy-looking weapons. They ordered him out. With a shrug, he stepped forward. They all pushed rudely past him into the elevator, which took them down to continue their search for him on the lower levels. This was fun, thought Ford, giving Colin a friendly pat. Colin was about the first genuinely useful robot Ford had ever encountered. Colin bobbed along in the air in front of him in a lather of cheerful ecstasy. Ford was glad he'd named him after a dog. He was highly tempted just to leave it at that point and hope for the best, but he knew that the best had a fair greater chance of actually occurring if Hull did not discover that his identity ease was missing. He had, <coughs> somehow, surreptitiously, to return it. They went to the express elevators. Hi, said the elevator they got into. Hi, said Ford. 
"'Where can I take you folks today?' said the elevator. "'Floor twenty-three,' said Ford. "'Seems a popular floor today,' said the elevator. "'Hm,' thought Ford, not liking the sound of that at all. The elevator lit up the twenty-third floor on its floor display and started to zoom upwards. Something about the floor display tweaked at Ford's mind, but he couldn't catch what it was and forgot about it. He was more worried about the idea of the floor he was going to being a popular one. He hadn't really thought through how he was going to deal with whatever it was that was happening up there, because he had no idea what he was going to find. He would just have to busk it. They were there. The doors slid open. Ominous quiet. Empty corridor. There was the door to Harl's office, with a slight layer of dust around it. Ford knew that this dust consisted of billions of tiny molecular robots that had crawled out of the woodwork, built each other, rebuilt the door, disassembled each other, and then crept back, crept back into crept back, excuse me, crept back into the woodwork again, and just waited for more damage. Ford wondered what kind of life that was, but not for long, because he was a lot more concerned about what his own life was like at that moment. He took a deep breath and started his run. <coughs> Sorry, folks, I've got a bit of a tickle in my throat. Let us hope that tea will resolve this. Arthur felt at a bit of a loss. There was a whole galaxy of stuff out there for him, and he wondered if it was churlish of him to complain to himself that it lacked just two things, the world he was born on and the woman he loved. Damn it and blast it, he thought. He felt the need of some guidance and advice. He consulted the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. He looked up guidance, and it said, See under advice. He looked up advice, and it said, See under guidance. It had been doing a lot of that stuff recently, and he wondered if it was all it was cracked up to be. He headed to the outer eastern rim of the galaxy, where it was said wisdom and truth were to be found, most particularly on the planet Hawalius, which was a planet of oracles and seers and soothsayers and also takeaway pizza shops, because most mystics were completely incapable of cooking for themselves. However, it appeared that some sort of calamity had befallen the planet. As Arthur wandered the streets of the village where the major prophets lived, it had been something of a, in a, something of a crestfallen air. He came across one prophet who was clearly shutting up shop in a despondent kind of way and asked him what was happening. "'No call for us any more,' he said gruffly as he started to bang a nail into the plank he was holding across the window of his hovel. "'Oh!' Why's that? Hold on to the other end of this and I'll show you. Arthur held up the unnailed end of the plank and the old prophet scuttled into the recesses of his hovel, returning a moment or two later with a small sub-ether radio. He turned it on, fiddled with the dial for a moment and then put the thing on a small wooden bench that he usually sat and prophesied on. He then took a hold of the plank again and resumed hammering. Arthur sat and listened to the radio. To be confirmed, said the radio. Tomorrow, it continued, Vice President Poffer Vigus Rupi Garstip will announce that he intends to run for president. In a speech he will give tomorrow at... Find another channel, said the prophet. Arthur pushed the preset button. Refuse to comment, said the radio. Next week's jobless totals in the Zabush sector, it continued, will be the worst since records began. A report published next month says, Find another, barked the prophet crossly. Arthur pushed the button again. Denied it categorically, said the radio. Next month's royal wedding between Prince Gid of Soofling Dynasty and Princess Huli of Rawi Alpha will be the most spectacular ceremony the Banji territories have ever witnessed. Our reporter, Trillian Astra, is there and sends us this report. Arthur blinked. 
The sound of cheering clouds and a hubbub of brass bands erupted from the radio. <coughs> a very familiar voice said, "'Well, Krat, the scene here in the middle of next month is absolutely incredible. Princess Hooli is looking radiant in a—' The prophet swiped the radio off the bench and onto the dusty ground, where it squawked like a badly tuned chicken. "'See what we have to contend with?' grumbled the prophet. "'Here, hold this.' Not that, this. No, not like that. This way. No, other way round, you fool. I was I was listening to that, complained Arthur, gra grappling helplessly with the prophet's hammer. So does everybody. That's why this place is like a bloody ghost town, he spat into the dust. No, no, I mean, that, that sounded like somebody I knew. Princess Hooley? If I had to stand around saying hello to everybody who's known Princess Hooley, I'd need a new set of lungs. Not the princess, said Arthur, the reporter. Her name's Trillian. I don't know where she got the Astra from. She's from the same planet as me. I wondered where she'd got to. Oh, she's all over the continuum these days. We can't get the Tri-D station, TV stations out here, of course, thank the great green arc or seizure. But you hear her on the radio, gallivanting here and there through space-time. She wants to settle down and find herself a nice steady era, that young lady does. It'll all end in tears. Probably already has. He swung with his hammer and hit his thumb rather hard. He started to speak in tongues. The village of oracles was not much better. He'd been told when looking for a good oracle it was best to find the oracle that the other oracles went to. But he was shut. There was a sign by the entrance saying, I just don't know any more. Try next door, but that's just a suggestion, not formal oracular advice. Next door was a cave a few hundred yards away, and Arthur walked towards it. Smoke and steam were rising from, respectively, a small fire and a battered tin pot that was hanging over it. There was a, also a very nasty smell coming from the pot. At least Arthur thought it was coming from the pot. The distended bladders of some of the local goat-like things were hanging from a propped-up dr line drying in the sun, and the smell could have been coming from them. There was also a worryingly small distance away <clears throat> there was also a worryingly small distance away a pile of discarded bodies of the local goat like things, and the smell could have been coming from them. But the smell could just as easily have been coming from the old lady who was busy beating flies away from the pile of bodies. It was a hopeless task, because each of the flies was about the size of a winged bottle top, and all she had was a table tennis bat. Also, she seemed to be half blind. Every now and then, by chance, her wild thrashing would connect with one of the flies in a richly satisfying thunk, and the fly would hurtle through the air and smack itself open against the rock face a few yards from the entrance to her cave. She gave every impression, by her demeanour, that these were the moments that she lived for. Arthur watched this exotic performance for a while, from a polite distance, and then at last t tried giving a gentle cough to attract her attention. The gentle cough, courteously meant, unfortunately involved first inhaling rather more of the local atmosphere than he'd so far been doing, and as a result he erupted into a fit of raucous expectoration and collapsed against the rock face, choking and streaming with tears. He struggled for breath, but each new breath made things worse. He vomit, vomited, half-choked again, rolled over his vomit, kept rolling for a few yards, and eventually made it up onto his hands and knees and crawled, pantingly, into a slightly flesher area of air. <coughs> Excuse me, he said. He got some breath back. I, I really am most dreadfully sorry. I, I feel a complete idiot. And... He gestured helplessly towards the small pile of his own vomit lying spread around the entrance to her cave. Oh, what can I say? He said. Well, what can I possibly say? This, at least, had gained her attention. She looked around at him suspiciously, but, being half blind, had difficulty finding him in the blurred and rocky landscape. He waved helpfully. Hello! he called. 
At last she spotted him, grunted to herself, and turned back to whacking flies. It was horribly apparent from the way that currents of air moved around when she did that that the major source of the smell was, in fact, her. The drying bladders, the festering bodies, and the noxious pottage may all have been making violent contributions to the atmosphere, but the major olfactory presence was the woman herself. She got another good thwack at a fly. It smacked against the rock and dribbled, it, it dribbled its insides down, <clears throat> down it in what she clearly regarded, if she could see that far, as a satisfactory manner. Unsteadily, Arthur got to his feet and brushed himself down with a fistful of dried grass. He didn't know what else to do by way of announcing himself. He had half a mind to just wander off again, but felt awkward about leaving a pile of his own vomit in front of the entrance to the woman's home. He wondered what to do about it. He started to pluck up more handfuls of the scrubby dried grass that was to be found here and there. He was worried, though, that if he ventured nearer the vomit, he might simply add to it rather than clear it up. Just as he was debating with himself as to the right course of action, he began to realise that she was at last saying something to him. "'I beg your pardon,' he called out. "'I said, can I help you?' she said in a thin, scratchy voice that he could only just hear. "'Um, I came to ask your advice,' he called back, feeling a bit ridiculous. She turned to peer at him myopically, and then turned back, swiped at a fly, and missed. "'What about?' she said. "'I, I beg your pardon?' he asked. "'I said, what about?' she almost screeched. "'Well,' said Arthur, "'just sort of general advice, really. It said in the brochure.' "'Ha! Brochure!' said the woman. She seemed to be waving her bat more or less at random now. Arthur fished the crumpled up brochure from his pocket. He wasn't quite certain why. He had already read it, and she, he expected, wouldn't want to. He unfolded it anyway in order to have something to frown thoughtfully at for a moment or two. The copy in the brochure witted on about the ancient mystical arts of the seers and sages of Hawalius, and wildly overrepresented the level of accommodation available. Arthur still carried a copy of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy with him, but found when he consulted it that the entries were becoming more abstruse and paranoid and had lots of X's and J's and other strange parentheses in them. Something was going wrong somewhere, whether it was in his own personal unit, or whether it was something or someone going terribly amiss, or just perhaps hallucinating at the heart of the guide organisation itself, he didn't know. But one way or another he was even less inclined to trust it than usual, which meant that he trusted it not one bit, and mostly used it for eating his sandwiches off when he was sitting on a rock, staring at something. The woman had turned and was walking slowly toward him now. Arthur tried, without making it too obvious, to judge the wind direction, and bobbed about a bit as she approached. Advice, she said. Advice, eh? Uh, yes, said Arthur. Y yes, that is. Um, he frowned again at the brochure as if to be certain that he hadn't misread it, and stupidly turned up on the wrong planet or something. The brochure said, The friendly local inhabitants will be glad to share with you the knowledge and wisdom of the ancients, peer with them into the swirling mysteries of past and future time. There are some coupons as well, but Arthur had been well, <laughs> there were some coupons as well, but Arthur had been far too embarrassed to actually cut them out or even to try and present them to anybody. Advice, say, eh? said the old woman again. Just sort of general advice, you say? On what? "'What to do with your life and that sort of thing?' "'Yes,' said Arthur, "'that sort of thing. "'Bit of a problem, I sometimes find, "'if I'm being perfectly honest.' "'He was trying, desperately, "'with tiny darting movements to stay upwind of her. "'She surprised him by suddenly turning sharply away from him "'and heading off towards her cave. "'Well, you have to help me with a photocopier, then,' she said. "'What?' said Arthur. "'The photocopier,' she repeated patiently. "'You'll have to help me drag it out. "'It's solar-powered. 
I have to keep it in the cave, though, so the birds don't shit on it. I, I see, said Arthur. The photocopier, she repeated patiently. I'll take a deep breath. I would take a few deep breaths if I were you, muttered the old woman as she stomped into the gloom of the cave mouth. Arthur did as she advised. He almost hyperventilated, in fact. When he was ready, he held his breath and followed her in. The photocopier was a big old thing on a rickety trolley. It stood just inside the dim shadows of the cave. The wheels were stuck obstinately in different directions, and the ground was rough and stony. "'Go ahead and take a breath outside,' said the old woman. Arthur was going red in the face, trying to help her move the thing. He nodded in relief. If she wasn't going to be embarrassed about it, then neither, he was determined, would he. He stepped outside and took a few breaths, and then came back in to do more heaving and pushing. He had to do this quite a few times, till at last the machine was outside. The sun beat down upon it. The old woman disappeared back into her cave and bought with her some mottled metal panels, which she connected to the machine to collect the sun's energy. She squinted up into the sky. The sun was quite bright, but the day was hazy and vague. "'It'll take a while,' she said. Arthur said that he was happy to wait. The old woman shrugged and stumped across to the fire. Above it, the contents of the tin can were bubbling away, and she poked about at them with a stick. Uh, "'It won't be wanting any lunch,' she inquired of Arthur. "'Oh, uh, I've eaten, thanks,' said Arthur. "'No, no, 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 not, not really. I, I, I've eaten.' "'I'm sure you have,' said the old lady. She stirred with a stick. After a few minutes, she fished a lump of something out, blew on it to cool it a little, and then put it into her mouth. She chewed on it, thoughtfully, for a bit. Then she hobbled slowly across to a pile of the dead goat-like things. She spat the lump out onto the pile. She hobbled slowly back to the can. She tried to unhook it from the sort of tripod-like thing that it was hanging from. Uh, can, can, "'Can I help you?' said Arthur, jumping up politely. He hurried over. Together they disengaged the tin from the tripod and carried it awkwardly down the slight slope that led downwards from her cave and towards a line of scrubby and gnarled trees which marked the edge of a steep but quite shallow gully from which a whole new range of offensive smells was emanating. "'Ready?' said the old lady. Uh, "'Yes,' said Arthur, although he didn't know for what. "'One,' said the old lady. Two, she said. Three, she added. Arthur realised just in time, in time what she intended. Together, they tossed the contents of the tin into the gully. After an hour or two of uncommunicative silence, the old woman decided that the solar panels had absorbed enough sunlight to turn the photocopier on, and she disappeared to rummage inside her cave. She emerged at last with a few sheaves of paper and fed them through the machine. She handed the copies to Arthur. "'This, um, this is your advice, then, is it?' said Arthur, leafing through them uncertainly. "'No,' said the old lady. "'It is the story of my life. "'You see, the quality of any advice anybody has to offer "'has to be judged against the quality of life they actually lead. "'Now, as you look through this document, "'you'll see that I've underlined all the major decisions I ever made to make them stand out. They're all indexed and cross-referenced, see? All I can suggest is that if you take decisions that are exactly opposite to the sort of decisions I've taken, then maybe you won't finish up at the end of your life, she paused and filled her lungs for a good shout, in a smelly old cave like this. She grabbed up her table tennis bat, rolled up her sleeves, stomped off to her pile of dead goat-like things, and started to set about the flies with vim and vigour. The last village Arthur visited consisted entirely of extremely high poles. 
They were so high that it wasn't possible to tell from the ground what was on top of them, and Arthur had to climb three before he found one that had anything on top of it at all other than a platform covered with bird droppings. Not an easy task. You went up the poles by climbing on the short wooden pegs that had been hammered into them in slowly ascending spirals. Anybody who was less diligent, a less diligent tourist than Arthur would have taken a couple of snapshots and sloped right off to the nearest bar and grill, where you could buy a range of particularly sweet and gooey chocolate cakes to eat in front of the ascetics. But largely as a result of this, most of the ascetics had gone now. In fact, they had mostly gone and set up lucrative therapy centres on some of the more affluent worlds in the northwest ripple of the galaxy, where living was easier by a factor of about seven million. And the chocolate was just fabulous. Most of the ascetics, it turned out, had not known about chocolate before they took up asceticism. Most of the clients who came to their therapy centres knew about it all too well. At the top of the third pole, Arthur stopped for a breather. He was very hot and out of breath, since each pole was about fifty or sixty feet high. The world seemed to swing vertiginously around him, but it didn't worry Arthur too much. He knew that, logically, he could not die until he had been to Stavromula Beta, and had therefore managed to cultivate a merry attitude towards extreme personal danger. He felt a little giddy perched fifty feet up in the air on top of a pole, but he dealt with it by eating a sandwich. He was just about to embark on reading the photocopied life history of the Oracle when he was rather startled to hear a slight cough behind him. <coughs> he turned so abruptly that he dropped his sandwich, which turned downwards through the air and was rather small by the time it was stopped by the ground. About thirty feet behind Arthur was another pole, and, alone amongst the sparse forest of about three dozen poles, the top of it was occupied. It was occupied by an old man who, in turn, seemed to be occupied by profound thoughts that were making him scowl. Hey, excuse me, said Arthur. The man ignored him. Perhaps he couldn't hear him. The breeze was moving about a bit. It was only by chance that Arthur had heard the slight cough. Uh, hello? Hello? called Arthur. The man at last glanced around him. He seemed surprised to see him. Arthur couldn't tell if he was surprised and pleased to see him, or just surprised. "'Um, are you open?' called Arthur. The man frowned in incomprehension. Arthur couldn't tell if he couldn't understand or couldn't hear. Um, I'll, I'll, pop, I'll pop over, called Arthur. Don't go away. He clambered off the small platform and climbed quickly down the spiralling pegs, arriving at the bottom quite dizzy. He started to make his way over to the pole on which the man was sitting, and then suddenly realised that he had disoriented himself on the way down, and didn't know for certain which one it was. He looked around for landmarks and worked out which was the right one. He climbed it. It wasn't. Damn, he said. Excuse me, he called out to the old man again, who was now straight in front of him and forty feet away. Um, got lost. Be with you in a minute. Down he went again, getting very hot and bothered. When he arrived, panting and sweating at the top of the pole that he knew for certain was the right one, he realised that the man was somehow or other mucking him about. What do you want? shouted the old man crossly at him. He was now sitting on top of the pole that Arthur recognised as the one that he had himself been sitting on when eating his sandwich. How, how, how did you get over there? called Arthur in bewilderment. You think I'm going to tell you, just like that, what it took me forty springs, summers and autumns of sitting on top of a pole to work out? What about winter? What about winter? D don't you sit on the pole in winter? Just because I sit up on a pole for most of my life, said the man, doesn't mean I'm an idiot. I go south in the winter. I've got a beach house. I sit on the chimney stack. Oh, right. D do you have any advice for a traveller? Yes. Get a beach house. I see. 
The man stared out over the hot, scrubby landscape. From here Arthur could just see the old woman, a tiny speck in the distance, dancing up and down, swatting flies. "'You see her?' called the old man suddenly. Y "'Yes,' said Arthur. I, I, "'I consulted her, in fact.' "'Fat lot she knows. I got the beach house because she turned it down. What advice did she give you?' Do exactly the opposite of everything she's done. In other words, get a beach house. I suppose so, said Arthur. Well, maybe I'll get one. Hmm. The horizon was swimming in a fetid heat haze. Um, any other advice, asked Arthur, other than what to do with real estate? "'A beach house isn't just real estate, it's a state of mind,' said the man. He turned and looked at Arthur. Oddly, the man's face was now only a couple of feet away. He seemed in one way to be a perfectly normal shape, but his body was sitting cross-legged on a pole forty feet away, while his face was only two feet from Arthur's. Without moving his head, and without seeming to do anything odd at all, he stood up, and stepped onto the top of another pole. Either it was just the heat, thought Arthur, or space was an entirely different shape for him. A beach house, he said, doesn't even have to be on the beach. Though the best ones are. We all like to congregate, he went on, at boundary conditions. Really? said Arthur. Where land meets water, where earth meets air, where body meets mind, where space meets time, we like to be on one side and look at the other. Arthur got terribly excited. This was exactly the sort of thing he'd been promised in the brochure. Here was a man who seemed to be moving through some kind of Escher space, saying really profound things about all sorts of stuff. It was unnerving, though. The man was now stepping from pole to ground, from ground to pole, from pole to pole, from pole to horizon and back. He was making complete nonsense of Arthur's spatial universe. Please, please, stop, said Arthur suddenly. Go on, take it, huh? said the man. Without the slightest movement, he was now back, sitting cross-legged, on top of the pole, forty feet in front of Arthur. You come home, <clears throat> come to me for advice, but you can't cope with anything you don't recognise. Hmm. So, we'll have to tell you something you already know, but make it sound like news, eh? Well, business as usual, I suppose. He sighed and squinted mournfully into the distance. Where are you from, boy? He then asked. Arthur decided to be clever. He was fed up with being mistaken for a complete idiot by everybody, he, by everyone he ever met. "'Tell you what,' he said, "'you're a seer. Why don't you tell me?' The old man sighed again. "'I was just,' said the man, passing his hand around behind his head, making conversation. When he brought his hand round to the front again, he had a globe of the earth spinning on his up-pointed forefinger. It was unmistakable. He put it away again. Arthur was stunned. How did you... I can't tell you. Why not? I I've come all this way. <clears throat> you cannot see what I see because uh, you see what you see. You cannot know what I know because you know what you know. What I see and what I know cannot be added to what you see and what you know because you are not of the same kind. Neither can it replace what you see and what you know, because that would be to replace you yourself. Ooh, hang on, um, can I write this down? said Arthur excitedly, fumbling in his pocket for a pencil. You can pick up a pocket, but pick up a copy at the spaceport, said the old man. They've got racks of the stuff. Oh, said Arthur, disappointed. Well, there isn't a, isn't there something that's a bit more specific like, to me? Everything you see or hear or experience in any way at all is specific to you. You create the universe by perceiving it, so everything in the universe that you perceive is specific to you. 
Arthur looked at him doubtfully. "'Can I get that at the spaceport, too?' he said. "'Check it out,' said the old man. "'It says in the brochure,' said Arthur, pulling it out of his pocket and looking at it again, "'that I can have a special prayer individually tailored to me and my special needs.' "'All right,' said the old man. "'Here's a prayer. You got a pencil?' "'Yes,' said Arthur. "'It goes like this. Mm -hmm. "'Let me see now. <clears throat> "'Protect me from knowing what I don't need to know. "'Protect me from even knowing that there are things that, to know that I don't know. "'Protect me from knowing that I decided to know about the things that I decided not to know about. "'Amen. Oh, "'That's it. "'It's what you pray silently inside for yourself anyway, "'so you may as well have it out in the open.' "'Hmm,' said Arthur. "'Well,' thank you there's another prayer <clears throat> another prayer that goes with it is very important continued the old man so you better jot this down too it goes lord 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 it's best to put that bit in just in case you never can be too sure lord 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 protect me from the consequences of the above prayer amen that's it. Most of the trouble people most of the trouble people get into in life comes from missing out that last part. Hmm. Have you ever heard of a place called Stavromula Beta? asked Arthur. No. Well, thank you for your help, said Arthur. Don't mention it, said the old man, and vanished. That is where I will vanish. Well, immediately. But that's where we'll call it a wrap for the evening. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming along and joining. Uh, same time next week. Same time, same place. Next week for the next uh, uh, steps in this. Um, as always, it's been great. Uh, as always, thank you very much for joining me and being part of this this journey. I hope you have a great week. You look after yourselves. You stay safe. And that you go, my prayer to you, the third prayer, <laughs> is that you go to patreon.com forward slash the bearded wit and become a patron of the bearded wit and support what I'm doing. Uh, if you could, I would be so happy. Um, but take care, look after yourselves and see you next Sunday. Bye, everyone.